Well, good morning and welcome to our worship at Cary Baptist Church for Sunday the 28th of February. Uh, a few notices. Uh, the first one is the least important, but a little bit strange. Someone borrowed the church scaffolding and they have now retired, returned it, which is great, but they've returned it without some of the some of the bits, the uh, spring loaded pins. So if, if you borrowed the church scaffolding uh, and you still have those pins, uh, please return them too, because we need them. It doesn't work without them. OK, so that's just a kind of a trivial notice. The others are more serious. Um, Joan Vaughan continues to be uh, in St Catherine's Hospice. At the time of recording this, she is, as far as I know, still hanging on to life. Last time I spoke to her daughter, she told me that Joan was not really responsive anymore. She wasn't conscious at any rate. And um, it's just a matter of time. So please, uh, we'll, we'll pray for Joan later in the prayers. But please remember her and uh, her family at this difficult time. And as many of you will now know, uh, Fiona Spaulding um, had bad news regarding her cancer, that it, it had come back uh, and that um, she will now be, be sent home from hospital, hopefully early next week, to receive uh, palliative care. So um, again, we'll, we'll pray uh, for Fiona and for Richard a bit later on. But they're the key notices. Um, we are having a deacons meeting on Wednesday. Uh, as you'd imagine, we can't, there's not a great deal we can do at the moment, so we won't be discussing uh, too many enormously momentous things. But there are things which nevertheless still have to go on, uh, even when we're in this situation. So please pray that we would make uh, the right decisions uh, for the future of the church on that occasion too. So I think that's it for notices. Uh, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace to us. Once again, we thank you, Lord, that, that you are with us in this situation. You're with us when, when things are painful and difficult, uh, as well as in the good times. And although we appreciate you being there in the good times, it's when things are hard that we appreciate you most, Lord, when we find that we are having to really lean on you. So we pray, Lord God, that you would draw near to us now. You would strengthen and help us in these difficult days. You would give us strength from your spirit to face them, Lord, and to be a light and a witness for you through them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, Lord, be all else to me, save that thou
Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Children's Talk together on the second Sunday in Lent. We are working our way towards Easter together. Now, here next to me, I have what I am calling 2020's Most Wanted. And it's all the things that this time last year, as we were heading into that first lockdown, we couldn't get our hands on in the supermarkets, could we? Everyone was buying things because they knew they were going to be at home. Some people a bit sillyly, you know, some people were being a bit silly and buying like a hundred and something toilet rolls at a time and not thinking about other people. But we all needed to buy things to be at home so much of the time didn't we and we were all at the supermarket trying to get hold of things because there was all this panic buying going on and so i've collected some of them up from around the house now now actually i struggled to find some of these in the house and we're a year later um which worried me slightly but over nearest to me here we have what i am going to call 2020s most wanted most wanted um we couldn't get hold of toilet roll could we at all it took weeks for toilet roll to appear back in the supermarkets and it, it it was the topic of a lot of news headlines was toilet roll we then have our basic things don't we like pasta and rice because people were at home so much people were buying the things that they enjoyed eating and who doesn't love a good carb with pasta and rice and you just couldn't find it in the supermarkets at all we then had see the toilet roll doesn't even want to stay now toilet rolls like i don't want people to see me uh, we then have our tinned goods again they keep in the in the cupboards don't they we can have tins in our cupboard for months and months and months and we can still eat them and so people were like well i'll just buy some except everybody thought oh i'll just buy some and so we couldn't get all the things like beans and tomatoes and i've got dog food over here because people were doing the same with dog food which is completely understandable i went to the supermarket and i buy nala's dog food in big in big bulk anyway because it just makes it cheaper but i went and i bought more than i normally would which was lucky because when i then needed dog food again there still wasn't any on the supermarket shelves and what there was which was similar to the beans and the tomatoes you could only buy a certain amount at a time couldn't you, you could only buy like three or four tins at a time well Nala eats a tin of this a day along with her biscuits and other stuff but she eats a tin as her as her tea time meal every single day and I could only buy three or four at a time depending on which supermarket I went to there are seven days in a week I, I was very stressed about dog food at one point this time last year you know we had trouble getting hold of hand soap and hand sanitizer although that was resolved pretty quickly wasn't it because some of the big shampoo companies and things stopped making certain items so that they could start production on hand sanitizer and soap which was amazing and it is one of them stories from the first lockdown where you know it, it makes you it, it gives you gives you hope and faith in the people around us and of course i couldn't do this list without mentioning flour we all baked that first lockdown didn't we banana bread sourdough people started making pasta I've also made pasta, uh, pizza dough. I know, Rachel, you're making pizza still. We were all m making things and we couldn't get hold of the things we needed. And that was a massive problem for some people over that first lockdown, over every lockdown, hasn't it? People haven't been able to get the things that they need. You know, some of these things are, you know, luxury, more luxury things. You know, being able to bake is a bit of a luxury. But not being able to get hold of baked beans and pasta and rice for some people for all of us but for some people they are what they eat all of the time these lockdowns have been hard on everyone for very different reasons you know some of us have had the things we needed have had the money to be able to buy the food that we need and so actually our physical needs have been met and that's been such a blessing but there have been people who have lost their jobs there have been people who would normally get school meals get that nice hot meal at dinner time off the dinner ladies and they haven't been able to have it i am personally really blessed touching as much wood as possible to not really personally know anyone who has lost their life but i have friends we all know people in the carey congregation who have lost their lives to covid 
this lockdown has been really hard on people and people haven't been able to get a hold of what they necessarily need. And that brings me to today's story, because in today's story, Jesus gives the disciples everything that they need to face the next week. He gives it them in one meal. Now, we did this meal at Mini Messy Church on Saturday, and it just happens that we are doing it today as well. Um, so we are in Mark 14, and we're reading from verses 17 to 25. In the evening, Jesus went to the house with the twelve. While they were eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will give me to my enemies, one of you eating with me now. The followers were very sad to hear this. Each one said to Jesus, I am not the one. Am I? Jesus answered, the man who is against me is one of the twelve. He is the one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The son of man must go to die. The scriptures say this will happen. But how terrible it will be for the person who gives the son of man up to be killed. It would be better for that person if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. He thanked God for it and broke it. He gave it to his followers and said, take it. This bread is my body. Then Jesus took the cup. He thanked God for it and gave it to the followers. All of the followers drank from the cup. Then Jesus said, this is my blood, which begins the new agreement that God makes with his people. This blood is poured out to many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink of this fruit of the wine again until the day when I drink in the new kingdom of God. So we are going to go and have a look a bit closer at what was going on in Jerusalem in like 30 AD. In Jesus times, in Bible times, we're going to have a look now. It was no different to any other Passover meal to start with. You see, I was under the table, waiting for crumbs, well away from the pile of stinky sandals in the corner. The men were talking loudly, sharing stories, doing what humans do around the dinner table. And well, as it went on, the atmosphere changed and the room started feeling all different. One of the men started talking. The guy at the end of the table. He held up bread in front of the others, tearing it up, passing it around. Crumbs flying everywhere. I got them as quickly as I could. He then took the jug of wine off the servant girl, held that up too and started sharing it around. He said it was his blood. I was a bit confused, you see. I didn't know what he was talking about. The other men looked a bit confused too. But they were silent, just staring at him. It was like he was preparing them for something, giving them really important instructions. Just like when someone asks me to sit or lie down. His eyes started to fill with tears and, well, I felt so sad too. I didn't know where to look or what to do, but I listened very carefully to all the words from the corner under the table. The men ate their bread like it was like it was the only thing they'd ever need to eat ever, ever again. And they didn't want anything after that, but after the amount they had eaten, that didn't surprise me. It was different from any other meal I've ever sat under the table for. But it made me feel all hopeful inside, like I wanted to join in. Really, join in. I know, I'm a dog. They wouldn't want me there, really. And when they were preparing to leave, I began to scurry about under the table to snap up as many of the crumbs as I could, catching them in my mouth. The man held out a piece of bread for me, and I felt all special in that moment. The bread was like something else, like something of him had spilled over into it. I've never forgotten that meal or that special man. And so we're back in 2020. So let's look at the past year. What has Jesus given us over the past year? Well, Jesus has given us lots of things 
physically, hasn't he? He has physically given us the sunshine during that first lockdown, which meant we could go outside after school and play in the garden and get a nice suntan. And those of us working from home found ways to be outside whilst we were working. We were also given the snow, weren't we, this winter? And it was so good to be out and about making snowmen and throwing snowballs and making snow angels. And those of us with dogs watching them run around and just make such, such joyful memories. He's also given us time, which sounds really silly. You can't give someone time. But let's think about it. You would normally walk to and from school or you would get the bus, those of you in high school, to and from school. You're not having to do that right now. Those of us that are adults that are working from home, we would normally have to commute places. We'd normally have to get in our cars or get on public transport and get to work. We haven't had to do that. And with that extra half an hour in the morning, I have either had a lion, I've made sure I've had a proper breakfast, I've given Nala half an hour run around off the lead on the field, and then of an evening, that half an hour when I finish work and I'd normally be travelling, I've, I've just, it's been a blessing. I've sat down with a brew, I've read a chapter of my book, I've watched telly before I've had to start tea and do all the evening things that have to be done. Jesus has given us the time to just chill out where we normally would have to be doing other things. In that time we've done things that we enjoy. The flower shows us that, you know, as I said, Rachel, you've been making pizza and I presume you've made other things as well because you're amazing at baking. But I've made pasta. Pasta's one of them things that you, you just buy and put it in a pan. But I spe spent the time making my own pasta and that meal was amazing. You know, how many people made banana bread? I think I made banana bread nearly every week for the first lockdown and I made some this week as well because I had the time and that's something I enjoy. I know some of you enjoy playing your games online and on your consoles and things and you've had the time to better yourselves at them. Some of you will be on TikTok and you will have had the time to make TikTok dances and learn things like that that you that you just you've wanted to do for a while. But let's think a bit deeper than the physical things that Jesus has given us. We've all felt anxious and overwhelmed, haven't we? Or scared and tired. And I find that I'm, at the minute I'm feeling those feelings in the supermarket. But I bet you guys felt it when you went back to school. People standing a bit too close. People not necessarily wearing their mask how they should be wearing it. You're standing in line. People are getting rude. People are getting aggy. People aren't following social distancing how they should be. And you just want to ask them to take a step back to give yourself that space to breathe but all it takes and I found this quite a lot is someone to show you that they're smiling you know quite a lot of the cashiers and the people who dick dick ding the food in the supermarket across the conveyor belt scanner thing you can tell they're smiling behind their mask their eyes show you that they're smiling at you and that takes away some of that anxiety as you come to sort your shopping out. I bet your teachers at school when you were there were so happy to have you sat down in class in front of them again and I bet their happiness, their smiles, the smiles of the people around you would lift some of that, some of that minging feeling inside away. And your teachers right now, even online, are going above and beyond for you because they care about you. We pass people on our daily walks and I found that people are, are, are politer. People are saying hello. People are asking how your day is going. People are starting to make comments that the bulbs are coming through and spring is on the way. This morning, Nala started running around on the field with somebody else's dog and they were having, they were having a, a, a doggy tug of war or whatever they were doing. And the lady was like, oh, it's nice to see them having fun. And actually, it really is we are given these opportunities by God to have that moment of <sighs> that moment that 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 breathe out moment that just that just lifts a little bit of them of them tight feelings in our chest away 
I think Jesus has provided us with so much over this past year, more than the physical things that we've needed, even sometimes more than more than the emotional and, and that, that feelings that we've needed. And he's given us that hope to carry on as Christians. We are so blessed to know what Jesus did for us on that cross. You know, days after our story today, we, we, we know what he did and he sacrificed himself so that when we have those moments where, where we get angry or we get aggy or we get, we're not necessarily kind and we don't do what is right. We have that opportunity to say sorry and start again. Every morning we have the opportunity to start the day as a brand new slate. No, nothing from the day before has to be there as long as we say we are sorry. Jesus has given us the little things that have made sure our head has stayed above the water during this pandemic. He's literally given us everything that we have needed and this week was the perfect week for me to do this because we now have this glimmer of hope. You know, we now have this date that isn't that isn't too far away where we might be able to hug each other again. We might be able to share in biscuits and coffee at church again. We'll be able to pop round to our grandparents and sit in their front room and and laugh and smile we'll be able to spend time with friends in ways that we've craved for over the past few months so before i pray i want us to think about what we can learn today from what jesus shared with that meal with the disciples so what can we learn from the mouse's story well he was kind and he was gentle wasn't he he reminded them why he was so important in their lives he hinted towards the future preparing them for what was going to happen and he gave them exactly what they needed we have that glimmer of hope we have that date in the future to focus our eyes upon we we can prepare for what is coming and jesus will not stop giving us what we need it might be that we need we need beans on the shelf it might be that we need toilet roll on the holder it might be that we need the sunshine, which is currently blinding me, which I'm not complaining about at all. It might be we need a breath of fresh air. But Jesus will continue to give us that. Continue always, not even just during this pandemic, forever and ever, every single day of your life, Jesus will give you what you need. So let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you are in our lives. You are amazing. And we cannot even put into words how much we love you. But Lord Jesus, right now we want to pray for those people who give us things in our life. The supermarket workers, the NHS, our doctors, the government, our teachers, Lord, we pray for them. Because they have given us so much, just as you have. And they deserve just as much of your love as we do. And Lord Jesus, we also pray for the people who are struggling, who need things right now. Maybe it's money, maybe it's time, maybe it's peace of mind. But Lord Jesus, we know that you can give them, give them that. And we want you to be the centre of their lives this week. Help us, if we can, show the people around us who you are and the amazing things you have done for them over the past year, just as we have recognised them together here today. In your powerful, almighty name. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name in
σε πιο
river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down I can sing of your love forever 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 Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever Foolishness I know But when the world has seen the light They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love Matthew chapter 24 verses 1 to 14 Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But he paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Amen. Our story begins with an invitation to a wedding. Not a pandemic wedding with a restricted guest list and distancing. A normal wedding. A wonderful gathering where family and friends get together to celebrate the couple's commitment to one another. And you can imagine people who haven't seen each other in years, hugging, catching up, shaking hands, not elbow bumping, or rushing off to sanitise their hands afterwards. 
sitting together in church for the ceremony, smiling, laughing, maybe crying, probably singing, and all without masks. And then the group photos where people stand close together without fear of what they might catch. And after comes the wedding banquet, food and drink and maybe music and dancing into the night. Sounds pretty good, right? You probably wouldn't turn down an invitation. You wouldn't want to miss a party like that or risk upsetting the bride and groom and their family by deciding not to come. But in the story that Jesus tells, this is what is happening, or at least the first century version of this. A wedding feast has been planned, and this is a really special wedding. This is a royal wedding. The king himself is inviting his people to the wedding feast of his son. But inconceivable as it seems, the guests refuse the invitation. Not many people would turn down an invitation to an ordinary wedding. But this is a royal wedding. The king himself has invited them, prepared a place for them, and yet they turn him down. Now the king is patient. He really wants those guests at the banquet. He wants to celebrate with them. He wants to bless them and he wants them to honor his son. So he thinks, okay, they didn't listen before, but I'll try again. I'll send out some more servants. I'll make sure they explain really clearly that the banquet is ready and that actually they need to come now. Now, as a parent of teenagers, I get that. You know, you tell them dinner's ready and they say, sure, coming. And then they don't come because they're finishing their game or their video or whatever. So you tell them again and you point out the food is ready actually now. So they need to come now, not in 10 minutes. But these guys, they're not teenagers who want five more minutes to finish what they're doing. They just don't want to come at all. Some of them ignored the king's messages and uh, went off to live their lives. One goes to his field. Another goes to his business. In Luke's version, one has bought a field he has to view. Another has bought five oxen he wants to try out. And still another has just got married. These guys, they make their ex excuses and they just went on ignoring the king's messengers. But others had a more hostile reaction. So they seized the servants, they mistreated them, and they killed them. And the king is enraged. He promptly sends his army to kill these wretches and burn their city to the ground. Now, when you send out wedding invitations, you probably don't expect anyone to shoot the postie. Or if for some reason you have to decline an invitation, you don't imagine that the father of the groom is going to call down a missile strike on your city. It seems, on the face of it, a little over the top. I mean, couldn't he just cross you off his Christmas card list or something? But of course, this is no ordinary wedding. The wedding feast is a picture the Bible uses to imagine the kingdom of heaven. And it's a great picture. These are people who are happy to be in the presence of God, happy to be with each other. They're celebrating together. They're enjoying one another's company. And a part of what makes it a great picture is that, of course, as a guest, you're not paying for any of this. You eat and drink and celebrate at the expense of your host. You are invited and enjoy the feast entirely because of his generosity and grace, which makes it all the stranger that anyone would turn down such an invitation. So what exactly is going on here? Let's remember where and when all this is taking place. This is the last week of Jesus' ministry. He has entered Jerusalem and he has been hailed as a king by many in the crowds. And then he's headed to the temple courts. And he's kicked over the stalls of the money changers. And he's told the chief priests that they have made the temple, the house of prayer for all nations, into a den of robbers. You could cut the tension with a knife. The leaders want Jesus dead. And Jesus is furious with them for rejecting God's ways. And the crowds are torn. Is Jesus the one or isn't he? There's a lot to like about him. But some of the things he says... So then immediately after clearing the temple, we have the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree. That's a prophetic act to show God's judgment on the leaders of Israel for having failed to produce the fruit that God required of them. Soon after that, the leaders challenge Jesus to explain what gives him the authority to speak and act as he does. But Jesus refuses to be drawn, answering them instead with a challenge of his own. And then he tells 
the two stories before this one. He tells a story of two sons, one who tells his father that he will do what he's been asked and yet doesn't do it, and another who refuses, but later changes his mind and goes and does what he's been asked to do. And that was a way of making the point that it was much better to be a sinner who repented, like the tax collectors and prostitutes coming to Jesus, than to be someone who claimed to be good, like the leaders, but who didn't live up to the promise. And then there was the parable of the tenants in the vineyard. and We looked at that earlier in our series on the parables. In that story, the vineyard tenants refused to share the fruit of the vineyard with the owner, as was his due for letting them have the land. They rejected and they beat the owner's servants and then they killed his son, seeking to take the vineyard for themselves. And this brought down the owner's wrath. He had them killed and the vineyard given to other tenants. And again, the message is a condemnation of the leaders of Israel. They are the tenants who have failed to produce the fruit that God desired. They killed the prophets and soon they'll kill Jesus himself. And this will bring God's judgment upon them and the vineyard will be given to others. And that's what this story is about, too, especially this version in Matthew's gospel. Luke also has a version of this parable in chapter 14 of his gospel, and that probably reflects how Jesus used the story in his ministry in Galilee. There, the element of welcome and invitation is dominant, and judgment, although present, is not so central. But here, amidst the tension and the hostility of the final week, Jesus retells the story with far more weight on the judgment to come upon those who reject God's ways, reject his messengers, and who are about to reject Jesus himself. By the time of Jesus, God had been sending his messengers, the prophets, to the people of Israel for centuries. And of course, some people listened to the prophets. We saw in the story of Elijah how even in those darkest days for Israel, God had reserved for himself 7,000 who hadn't bowed the knee to the pagan god Baal. But sadly, for much of the time, the message of the prophets went unheeded. Some folk were perhaps just apathetic. They wanted to live their lives. They most likely believed in God, but he wasn't important to how they lived their lives. Perhaps Jesus had this kind of person in mind with some of the figures in the parable, the guy who wants to check out his field or, or test drive his new oxen. But there was a third group, a group that neither accepted the message of the prophets nor was apathetic to it. There was a group who reacted with anger and violence, perhaps because their vision of what God wanted was so different that they were outraged by the true word of the Lord or perhaps because they were rich and powerful and they had the most to lose from a disruption of the status quo. Both of those motives were represented amongst those who opposed Jesus. Pharisees who were outraged by Jesus' welcome to the sinners and the outcast of society. Rich men who didn't like all this talk of good news for the poor and, and woe to the rich, who may not have liked the Romans very much, but definitely did not want anyone upsetting the apple cart and making their nice, comfortable lives any harder. Rulers like the chief priests who presided over the temple that Jesus had condemned for its narrow nationalistic vision, its failure to be a house of prayer for all nations. Whilst apathy is no way to respond to an invitation from your king, it is surely this last group that provoked the king's anger the most. Those who react with violent hostility towards his messengers will face destruction themselves. He sends his army to destroy them and to burn their city. This is not the overreaction of a put out parent to a refused wedding invitation. It is the reaction of God to those who murdered his prophets time and time again and then murder his own son. Nor is it merely lashing out in anger. It is God stepping back and allowing the leaders of Israel to continue on the course that they are so determined to follow. This is their choice. Within a generation, the narrow nationalism that could turn the court of the Gentiles into a marketplace would lead to war with Rome. 
The leaders would pay with their lives, the city would burn and the temple would be torn down. Not because God wanted those things to happen, but because that was the path the people chose when they rejected Jesus, when they rejected the way of peace that he offered. Now, to us reading the Gospels in 2021, that connection may not be so obvious. This is all a really long time ago. But to literally every reader of the Gospel in the early church, it would have been as clear as day that when Jesus spoke about an army burning the city, he was surely talking about the cataclysmic events of the first Jewish Roman war, which to them was fresh in their memories. The parable, though, of course, isn't simply a story of judgment. It is also a message of good news. The wedding invitation may have been refused by the political and the religious leaders of Israel, but it was now to go out to everyone. And this was always God's intention. It's not something he just thought of when those he first he first invited rejected the message. To imagine that would be to take the parable too far. God's intention was always that the blessing would come to all nations through Abraham and his descendants. And as we saw last week, that the temple would be a house of prayer for all nations. But that hadn't really happened in the way it should in the old covenant. But now it would happen in the new covenant. Through Jesus, the gospel invitation went out to the poor and the blind and the lame and the marginalised, to the children and the foreigners and the lepers and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And of course, the invitation was still there to the religious leaders and the rich and the powerful, but only a few of them were willing to admit their need and turn to Jesus. And then following Pentecost, the church took the invitation out to the whole world, to people of every tribe and nation and tongue to people of every generation, to you and to me. And this is the good news. We are invited to the great kingdom banquet. And just like any wedding invitation, it is a free gift. No one sends out wedding invitations that say, we'd love you to come to our wedding. Uh, that'll be a hundred pound, please. Sure, you probably want to bring a gift, but that isn't an entry fee. You do that because you care about the couple and you want to bless them as they start out on this new stage in their lives. And this is how it is with the kingdom of God. We are invited to come in free of charge. The parable tells us that the invitation went out to the street corners, to the good and to the bad alike. And Luke tells us the invitation went, not out, went out not only to the street corners, but to the country lanes. It went to the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. The invitation is for everyone, everyone without exception. It is for you and for me. And the most important thing that we can do in our lives is to choose to accept that invitation, to say, yes, Lord, I want to accept you as my Lord and as my savior. I want to be a part of this great wedding banquet that you are planning. That would be a nice note to end on. But Jesus went on from there. He tells how when all are gathered in and enjoying the banquet, the king notices a man who wasn't in the proper wedding clothes. Some scholars think that actually Matthew might have combined two separate parables here, because on the face of it, it seems pretty unreasonable to drag someone in from the street corner and then expect them to already be in their best suit. But whether Jesus told it this way or Matthew has edited it like this, the message is still clear. To accept the invitation of the gospel requires us to change. Whether we think of the wedding clothes as the righteousness of Christ given to all who trust in him, or the righteous deed, the good deeds done by those who trust in him in response to his grace, the point is the same. We need to be sure that we are really following Jesus, that we have really made him our Lord. And Lord, not as a nice religious title that we might say when we say our prayers, but Lord meaning the guy who's in charge, the one in charge of our lives. You see, the chief priests, they thought they were following God, but their failure to see that the temple and Israel as a whole was meant to be a light to the nations meant they were really just following their own agenda. Similarly, the Pharisees, with their obsession with the minutiae of the law, which they thought was honouring to God, that had led them to lose sight of what really mattered, what Jesus called the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy. And the final part of the parable then is a warning to those of us who call ourselves Christians, 
to remember that whilst the wonderful invitation to the kingdom banquet is free of charge, the life of Christian discipleship involves challenge and it involves change. It involves keeping Jesus himself always before us, not because this is a task that we perform to earn God's favour, but because that is what real faith, real trust in God looks like. It reminds us that a faith in name only, or a faith that is really about following our own agenda, is not really Christian faith at all. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in a time of deep need for our nation and our world. We pray for your mercy as we continue to face the worry, the pain and the loss of the COVID pandemic. We pray that you would have mercy upon those who mourn at this time, whether their loss is due to COVID or other causes. We pray that they would know your comfort and your help. We pray for those known to us who are unwell at this time. 
We thank you that Sean is home from hospital. We pray that you would have your hand upon him to help him recover quickly and that the planned surgery would be successful. We pray for Joy while she cares for him and for Eden while still working, teaching online and before long back in school. We pray for Pete, that you would have your hand upon him for recovery and that the test that he is having would help the doctors to pinpoint the necessary treatment and that, that treatment would prove to be wholly effective. We pray for Jimmy and Mildred as they face the problems that come with old age and ill health. And we pray for Cliff and Joy and Francis and Barry as they face the emotional pain that comes with facing dementia. Pray for Ian Argyle, who's been unwell for quite a while now. We pray that this new treatment would begin to make a real difference and that he would soon feel less pain, less tiredness and less irritation. We pray that he will begin to make a recovery and that in the days ahead, he will get better and better until he is back at full health before long. And in the meantime, we pray for Anne as she cares for him. We pray for Joan Vaughan, who at the time of recording is, is still hanging on to life. We pray that she would know your peace and your comfort in her final hours or days. And we pray for Richard and Fiona. We pray that Fiona would be able to get home from hospital in the coming week and that she'd be able to enjoy a period of reasonable health in the days ahead. We pray that she will have the health and time to speak with family and friends and to say all that she would like to say to them and that they would have the time and opportunity to say all that they would wish to say to her. We pray that you would keep both Richard and Fiona strong with the strength that comes from your Holy Spirit in the difficult and painful days that lie ahead. We thank you that the vaccine rollout is going well in the UK at least, and we pray that it would continue to do so and indeed in the rest of the world. We continue to pray that as many people as possible would get the jab and that scientific advice would trump internet conspiracy and ignorance. And we pray in general that better ways would be found to deal with the insidious menace of fake news, conspiracy theory and internet rumour. We continue to pray for our young people and for those throughout the country and the world where their schooling is being greatly disrupted and there are concerns about the long term effects on their mental health. We pray for the children, certainly in the UK, that you would calm their anxieties as they face a return to school in a week's time. We pray that the measures that are put in place would be adequate to keep them safe. In particular, we pray for greater clarity over testing and mask wearing. And we pray that going forward, children would have the help that they need to catch up on missed education, to get the help that they need to deal with mental health problems as well. We realise that this, as with almost every social problem, hits the poor the hardest. That those who've not had access to a laptop or a good internet connection have fallen behind and that we're just amazed that in this country, one of the richest countries in the world, that this could happen. But we pray that the government would show a real commitment to tackle this problem. Perhaps it would be addressed in the coming budget and that they wouldn't need to be shamed into action on these issues by Premier League footballers. And we think of the poor. As we think of the poor, we think of the poorest people around the world as well. We pray that governments in the developing world would be able to get access to vaccine supplies that they need. We thank you that some at least are beginning to get some access. And we pray that they would have the resources and the logistical capabilities to deliver the vaccines to their population. And we pray that in this year, in which the UK hosts the G7 summit and the COP26 climate summit, that radical action would be taken to address climate change. Words are easy, but the reality is that most countries are not on target to meet their commitments under the Paris Accords, and it is far from certain that those targets are even adequate. Already, we hear that the world's poorest people are suffering from unpredictable weather patterns, disrupting their usual agriculture, leaving people who would seem to be escaping from severe poverty extremely vulnerable to food and water insecurity and at increased risk of severe weather events. We pray that world leaders and ordinary citizens throughout the world would grasp the need for radical action before this situation becomes even worse. We pray that none of us would be willing to turn a blind eye or to not be fully informed on this issue. And we continue to pray for the work of the BMS and Tear Fund and their partners around the world. We thank you for their work in BMS hospitals and medical projects and in refugee camps in Syria and Bangladesh and elsewhere as they serve the poorest people in Christ's name, even in the face of the COVID pandemic. 
And in particular, we pray for the Guinea Bore 2 Hospital in Chad, where our link missionary, Claire Bedford, is normally based, but which she can't return to at the moment because of COVID travel restrictions. We pray that she'd be able to get back there soon and that you would continue to bless their work in helping the poor and the sick of that land. We ask all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. So